So I want to welcome everybody. And the uh, schedule is we're going to have a quick review of our ultrasound interpretation that we covered last month or two months ago. We're going to do some case presentations of pavlic harness application and use, and then some case presentations of arthrogram, close reduction, and casting techniques. So I want to jump right into our first case. And uh, for our panelists to be thinking about this one, I want to talk a little bit after they take a look at this. But this is a firstborn girl, Ortolani positive right hip, no family of uh, DDA, no family history of DDH, and 35% coverage at rest with an alpha angle of 47 degrees. So we're looking at obviously the ultrasound, and in order to review that a little bit, the coronal view is uh, done with static measurements, and uh, the alpha angle is obviously what we look for. So this is the graph method. The alpha angle, if you think of it, we're looking at the pelvic line like this. And this, this basically is the alpha angle on ultrasound. And if you turn it sideways, because it's like, it's like your video camera, if you turn your video camera sideways, then you're looking at it sideways. So we're looking at the alpha angle like that. Here's an example of the alpha angle on ultrasound. And there's a beta, a beta angle as well. But the alpha angle is the one that we pay the most attention to. We also can look at things like the edge of the uh, acetabulum, whether this is a sharp or rounded border. And you can look at the cartilage in here and see how it looks. The graph classified these as uh, normal with an alpha angle greater than 60 degrees. It's class 1. Class 2 is a mild deficiency when it's 43 to 60 degrees. Class 3, less than 43 degrees. And class 4 is really dislocated. Cundy, though, if you think about that, the less than 60 degrees at birth, the median is 70 degrees. And so less than 60 is almost two standard deviations from the mean. And by six weeks, the average has increased to 76 degrees. And by three months, Peter Cundy showed it's 80 degrees. So keep that in mind that by three months, the average is 80 degrees. The, um, if you look here, this is at six weeks. And here's 60 degrees down here. So even at six weeks, the alpha angle should be pretty, pretty big. Treatment based on graph. Graph said the type uh, 2A, less than three months old, which is 50 to 60 degrees. At three months of age, though, if the alpha angle is less than 60 degrees, then the pavic is recommended. And then at birth, if it's 43 degrees, the pavic is used here. So the Harkey method is the other method that many of our panelists prefer. And it reproduces the Barlow test. Uh, it's reported as coverage with and without pressure. So you can see here's one that's 50% coverage without pressure and 40% coverage with pressure. And greater than 50% is considered normal and should be stable. The, um, the transverse method is this. Pablo, do you want to say something about the transverse method? Yes, if I could just add to that. Um, I think what most clinicians use nowadays is what we've termed the dynamic standard minimal test, which actually includes both dynamic and morphologic testing. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to you looking at. You need to know how much displacement a hip has and what the morphology is. It's very easy to understand the transverse view. And that image you have up it makes it very easy to understand. You can see um, the femoral head, which you're pointing out right there. And if you just imagine this as the baby sort of being on its side, as you see in that view, you can see the femoral head. And it's well seated within that acetabulum. But that's, I think that the dynamic component is what's most often left out when radiologists do the exam, as opposed to being done by a clinician. So I think you need to take into account both um, the dynamic part, but as well as the morphologic part. But for me, this is the most important view you're going to have of the hip. Well, it reproduces the, um, the Barlow test, for sure. And uh, likewise, though, when you turn it, you're actually looking at it like this. 
So when it shows up on the screen, and what and the ones that you'll see in our presentation are like this, with the femoral head, uh, the femoral head here, and the acetabulum here, and the labrum in this part. And if if it's displaced, this distance increases from the triradic cartilage to the femoral head. Is that fair, Pablo? Yes, that's correct. That's almost like an equivalent of looking at a CT scan, like an axial view of the pelvis. And you can imagine um, the child's buttocks being on the top part of your screen when you're looking at this. And it's the posterior labrum that you can see, that triangle in the back there. So I think that's the most important view because that's what's going to determine your acetabular development, is having a normal head well seated within that acetabulum. So yes, I think that's a very fair view. So, by the Harkey method, the um, transverse view, the newborns may have four to six millimeters of instability, and that may resolve. But the general treatment indications, this is not a, a cookbook, but at birth, you would treat dislocated hips. At three weeks, if subluxation is present, and at six weeks, if instability is present, it's judged by really almost any movement of three to four millimeters, and you would continue treatment until stable. Any comment, Pablo? Um, no, agree. Um, as you know, my classification means I only consider two kinds of hips, those that are normal and those that are abnormal. So an abnormal hip can be dislocated, subluxated, or unstable, and that requires treatment. Um, as to the timing of doing it, I think if you're talking about a screening program, it's probably wise to wait a few weeks for those uh, false positives to go away. But if at three weeks you have subluxation, instability, or dysplasia, I think you need to treat. And agree, you continue treatment until the hip is not only stable, but completely normal. All right. Any comments from you, Scott? Again, yeah, I think in any of these, you, you relate it to the clinical exam. And most of these hips that are a little bit uh, dysplastic or a little bit loose will have a tight adductor on that side if you're, if you're careful and look at the baby. And that will help you make your decision. Very good. How does it help? Give well, if you got a mild change on ultrasound and a mild uh, adductor tightness on the same side, I go ahead and treat. Uh, so these these questionable ones help. It helps a lot to see the exam. Okay. So here we go back to our um, firstborn girl. And I will ask Bruce Foster uh, to take a look at this and tell us what you would do. Bruce. Yes, I think with the Ortolani positive hip, we would uh, treat that baby, uh, irrespective of whatever the ultrasound showed. And uh, but where the joining the group has helped is that we have been having the discipline of doing the ultrasounds before treatment, and now and giving us information to, which may be useful. But for an Ortolani positive hip, we would treat. And how would what would and you our, treat our it with? treatments with a fixed our 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 fixed uh, our treatments with a fixed uh, type of abduction brace, uh, locally here Dennis Brown splint, but it's modified by having a curved sacral bar. So like everywhere we call it where we are we call it the Adelaide splint, because the sacral bar being curved holds it in that safe zone rather than full abduction of the uh, of the usual Dennis Brown splint. So you're not using a pavic harness? Not at all. No. Not at all? No. Okay. Um, so here are some splints um, and braces. Scott, could you comment on some of these? Do you, are you familiar with all of these? These are different uh, static and dynamic splints. If you want to comment or I can. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't used Yeah, I haven't used them, uh, a lot of them. Uh, a lot of them are... Um, the, the problem with some of them that they force too much abduction. So the Frica pillow is probably the classic example. Frica was Pavlik's uh, mentor, and he got out away from it because of the ABN rate, because it pushes the hip out too much abduction. And and a lot of them have a fixed uh, uh, abduction because of the bar and so on, like the Ilfeld. Um, and they may not control enough hip flexion to the to keep the hips in sockets. But I think the rigidity of of them is the problem. Well, uh, Pablo, you've had some experience with this one, haven't you? The Correctio? Yes, um, the Correctio brace. Um, 
we were able to get our hands, thanks to the IHDI, on a few of these correctio braces. And one of the things that comes down to those, what works for you, you, you can't get these braces easily in some places. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, the Pavlik is actually very widely available. It's easy to obtain almost anywhere. We have used the Correctio brace and actually had good results with it, but I agree completely with Scott that the problem with this is sometimes you can have fixed abduction. And I learned from Scott this is the Pavlik method where what you're looking for is dynamic abduction. You want to keep these hips in flexion and allow the abduction to come passively, which is easy to obtain with a Pavlik harness and sometimes not so easy to, to obtain with these. But perhaps Woody could tell us about the Yilfeld because he has some experience with that one too. Yeah, so um, so I agree. Um, Pavlik is generally my first line of treatment as well, and, and I agree with the, the method of uh, passive abduction. But I do think that every hip is a little different, and I think that some hips uh, do respond uh, a little bit better to having a more rigid orthosis. And we, the Ilfeld for me is my second line uh, orthosis if my Pavlik is not working. We've had some pretty good results with that, and I just think that every hip is a little bit different. I think. Sometimes the degree of flexion, as Scott pointed out, is different, especially in the ULFA. It tends to hold the hips in less flexion, and I think for certain hips, a little bit of extension uh, may help get them over the hump if you're having some trouble with the pelvic. So um, I, I think the bottom line is I agree with uh, Pablo that you know whatever works in your hands uh, is probably fine, and I think that certain hips uh, may benefit from a more rigid orthosis um, if you're not working with the pelvic initially. Very good. Well, the tubigen splint or turbigen splint has recently been, there have been two publications recently which suggest that it has better results than the Pavlik. And one thing about all of these is they don't hold the legs, but um, these are just all alternatives to uh, the Pavlik or to other ones. But the Pavlik is clearly the most common here. Um, Scott, do you want to take us through this, the Pavlik, uh, some of these questions, hours of wear, clothing, diaper changes, cleaning, and so forth? Uh, most most hips I'll use about initially at 23 and a half hours, except for the very unstable ortolani positive, uh, where I initially may use it 24 hours. And clothing? And weight undershirt or onesie underneath? Underclothing, yeah. You'd like a onesie or a t-shirt underneath, uh, and then something over the top of the harness to hide it and to keep the baby from herping on their undershirt. The uh -huh. diapers can be changed without taking out the harness, off the harness, so that's a big advantage over this and, and those other braces you saw, because you don't have to re take the baby out of the harness. Cleaning the harness is usually every other day or so, when the baby gets a bath, it's a good time to wash the harness. Positioning, the top figure shows the ideal position with the flexor strap, which is the front strap at the anterior axillary line of the infant. Uh, the stirrups should be up near the popliteal fossa, and this controls the knee, which controls the hip. And then the back straps, which you, you can see on the lower picture, should be over the scapula with the chest strap at the nipple line. And uh, this that shows the proper position. Uh, use I use it till I have a, basically a normal normal X-ray. Yeah, ultrasound has to be normal, exam has to be normal, and then X-ray has to be near normal. Now I, the last month or so it'll probably be at nighttime use. So they'll wear it for three months or four months. You're going to get an X-ray at four months. I'd say on a new yeah a newborn would be about three months full time and then a month or so part time. Nighttime. Anybody else have a different wearing uh, schedule? Three months full time for we're talking for a dislocated ortolani positive hip, right? Yeah, I, I only use for six weeks, and if I need to use it longer, I usually change it to Rhino Cruiser brace because it's a lot easier for parents to put that brace on and take it off. Mm -hmm. Okay, well I, there. But but most of us are bracing for three months. I think there is some there are some reports of bracing for six weeks and being successful. But mainly, I think you'd brace until the hip is stable. You agree, Pablo? Well, I brace until the hip is completely normal. 
Um, I found that the Pavlik harness is actually very easy and very friendly for their parents to use. Once they get used to wearing it for that initial period, keeping it on becomes more of an issue of when the child starts to move around a bit more of keeping it on. But I've had much better experience with the Pavlik harness than any kind of rigid orthosis, so I'll just keep on bracing until it's completely normal, whether it's by ultrasound in the first few months or by x-ray, as Scott said, I will brace until it's normal. Okay. I think, I they're think actually so. More, they're actually more mobile in the harness than they are the other braces because they can move their hips around, they can crawl in the harness and so on, and yeah. even walk. So, Scott, will you comment about these harnesses? Sure. So the top left one, if you want to point to that one that we're talking right there, uh, the, the chest strap, first of all, is a little too low. It has to be at the nipple line, and so you don't have a good control of uh, access. We lost you. We lost the you. The flexor Scott. strap is too medial. Too medial. Pardon? Sorry? No, you got it. Going we're too back. fast? No, you're back. Okay. The flexor strap is too medial, and so as you tighten it, it actually attempts to dislocate the hip. And thirdly, the straps on the stirrups are too low to the popliteal fossa, and therefore they, they flex the knee uh, without controlling the hip. And uh, so that, that harness is a mess and needs to be changed. Okay. The second one, the second one it looks too much flexion in this view, and I, and I would guess that the back straps or the abduction straps are a bit too tight. It looks like it, just the way yeah. the baby's sitting there, but you really can't tell. But it's a little too flexed, uh, and you might run into problems with a uh, femoral nerve palsy with that much flexion. The third baby looks, the third picture, if you want to move that, looks pretty good. I don't have too much to... We lost you. ...positioned on that view. Okay. The fourth, sorry, the third is good. Now to number four. Um, a little over flex. Now, again, you can't quite tell without physically examining the child, but the, the flexion is a bit too much, which again puts you at risk for femoral palsy. And the last one, number five, uh, is again real poor, uh, mainly because the flexor straps are too medial and the stirrup straps are way down on the calf. So all you're getting is knee flexion to 150 degrees and not good control of the hips. So that's that one's real poor quality. Okay, good. Um, here are a couple of videos of kids in them. Are these okay, Scott? Seem to be moving. I, I, the, the fit looks good. Uh, the child's kicking and moving and all. So those are okay. It helps acetabular development. Uh, yep. I think so. Yep, I think those are good. Those are mine, so I hope they're good. Um, how about this, <laughs> how about this, Kishore? Yeah, so this one um, looks like this child probably has uh, femoral palsy. This is something, obviously, we tell parents to look when they put, you know, when they put the public harness on to see child is actually able to kick the legs and make the knee straight. So clearly the harness is off here and uh, yeah, I, I would, if I have any hint, in, often I tell the parents, don't wait till you come to the clinic and just take the harness off and, uh, and then give us a call and then we can, we can talk about it. And um, what do you do at this point? So uh, I, I would wait. So I usually take the harness off completely both sides and I ask them to give me a call if the femoral palsy is sort of recovered. Um, and, and I would have tend to another try. Usually I've tried if if I thought with Pavlik they developed and I put them in a rhino and people would argue probably rhino would put it in a more extreme position than, than a Pavlik. And uh, I, I've been successful about probably 50% of the time going back and other times I would just wait Till the child is old enough, old enough to put them in a spiker cast. Okay. Um, it is more common with higher grade dislocations, and 
there's at least one paper that says uh, what Kishore said, discontinue the harness until it recovers. If it recovers quickly, then it may be successful, but when they don't recover very quickly, the success rate is lower. Uh, and I've lost my screen somehow. Any comments about that from our gallery? Yeah, I, I would say, we, I mean, yeah, a lot of what I found was actually the, in the fixed dislocations, ones that I've had uh, very rarely with those subluxable hips. These are often, you know, dislocated at rest, whether reducible or reducible, more with reducible hips. Uh -huh. Well, we, we, we I mean, we don't see it, uh, I would say, in San Diego much at all. And dislocations and follow them very closely, sometimes twice a week. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Chad? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, so we follow them closely, but sometimes twice a week. And watch them carefully. If you're, you know, working your straps, then you you have to follow them closely, do your ultrasounds, and obviously not over flex them because it's related to too much flexion. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go back to our case. Um, Bruce has already treated this child with his uh, with his device, and uh, here we are, two weeks, and we've got a good. 62% uh, coverage in the alpha angle of 60 degrees, and um, we're making progress. There shows the left hip. I hadn't shown the left hip earlier. At four weeks, there's no change. It looks stable. Um, everyone would continue bracing at this point? Yes. 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 Okay. Now we're at two months. We've got 65% coverage, and this is flexion uh, transverse view. I think you can see the femoral head's in good position. There's the labrum. Uh, I didn't put the stress view up, but it, it's stable. So at two months, you would still continue. Is that correct? Scott? Yes. Okay. Yes, for sure. I, what? I, I would I, I discontinue and just probably go to nighttime. I, I usually uh -huh. only use six to eight weeks. Okay. I think that's an option. And now we are at four months. And uh, everyone would have been at part-time bracewear, or do you ever just discontinue completely? I just discontinue completely. I uh, think it's easier to keep the parents just go from full-time to just not wearing it. Weaning has not been good in my experience. How many people wean? Well, I, I, I certainly wean. If you wean, and they're pretty happy if you go to nights, and you'll get two more months of bracing out of the deal even because they, they can keep they keep a hip abduction contracture for at least yeah continue think, at night so they'll they'll have what I call the invisible invisible brace <laughs> I think most of us do weaning Woody do you wean yeah I do wean uh, I wean over usually for a hip that's totally normal on ultrasound I wean over about uh -huh. six weeks about six hours every two weeks but I admit that's that's probably personal preference without much uh, substantiation for it okay so Woody when are you going to see this patient back so I, I just put people because it's just easier for my protocol for my nurses and my staff and everything to, to kind of get people into a, a standard regimen so uh, if we were discontinuing the harness at four months which is what I would do in this patient um, I probably would have weaned a little bit earlier like Kishore would have um, but uh, I would get I would see him in six months of age with an x-ray uh, as my standard thing so you know if I've discontinued four months or discontinued five months or discontinued three and a half months I still see him at six months of age with that x-ray just to get him on a standard pathway all right, so I think most of us would do that, but this child never returned. How vigorous should we be at getting him back? Bruce? Yeah, well, I was going to say, I think we should be vigorous. I think uh, the patient loss to follow-up is a failure of treatment. Um, uh, that may be an overstatement, obviously, but intellectually it is. And... Uh, I think we want to be sure that at walking the x-ray is normal. Yeah, I think the child's still at risk. Okay, let's do another case. Um, we'll give this one to um, to Woody. If you would uh, comment on this. This is a child that came, these are two different kids that came for a referral with outside ultrasound. Six-week-old girl. Actually, I guess it's the same child, left and right, referred for mild dysplasia, and this was the ultrasound prior to uh, 
you can see the alpha angle is only 57 degrees. Would you comment on that, Woody? Yeah, I'm not sure how accurate uh, that is. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, you like to see a nice horizontal uh, ilium to feel like you're getting an accurate measurement if you're focusing on the acetabulum with your uh, with your ultrasound probe. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't, you know, I don't know where those lines are. They're a little, uh, little, little floating and, and probably not so inaccurate. But regardless of what you think the acetabular measure is, certainly the femoral head position is not ideal. So um, you know, you can quibble about. Uh, the measurements of the angle, but uh, that hip needs to be treated. Uh, in Pablo's uh, classification, uh, it would come out as abnormal. Yeah, well, this is completely dislocated, um, as you can see. And so I, oh, I put this in there because you can't rely on the radiologist report any more than we rely on it for a radiograph. And we've got quite a collection of these. Um, have the others of you seen these from outside, uh, outside places that have where they might just send the report? Oh yeah, I've seen it. I've we I've seen it with X-rays where they've read it as Shatton's line intact and the hips are both dislocated because yeah. they're looking at the wrong Shatton's line. So so this is a good reason to know. Yeah. So you need to know how to read your own ultrasounds. All right. Here's our our next case. Um, yeah. This is a newborn uh, female breech twin attending examination. Right is Ortolani, left uh, negative, and. Um, so, Bruce, you said in the past you would treat this without an ultrasound. Would you get an ultrasound of both hips now or yeah. not? Yes, no, we, we would. I think we're getting more information, and particularly when it's starting to get more in our hands, like Scott has his setup, um, uh, we get uh, more information about the stability of the hip in terms of how, how much you can safely abduct the hips and hold them in position or not. As I say, we we more often than not use still a fixed type of brace in our in our institution. That's just been our, our management. With close follow up on the day of application of the brace to see if the hip is in located. Well this one was clearly a negative by multiple examiners on the left side. But the ultrasound um, the ultrasound, this is right and left, and both hips are completely dislocated. So, and it's really round here, and the, uh, so the Ornolani exam failed us. We've, we were resistant to getting them at birth as well, but now we find that we get prognostic information, and we have found two children that had a dislocated hip on the other side. So it gives us some good information to get the ultrasound prior to treatment. So here's a week in the harness. Um, we're, what do you do at a week? You still keep going, right, everybody? I think you can see this is not reduced. Neither side is reduced, correct? Correct. All right. All right. Um, now we're two weeks old in the harness, and uh, here's a good view of this transverse view where you see this space between the femoral head and the triradic cartilage in the neutral position and the flex position. And so we're still on the left hip, we're uh, still out. The right hip here is uh, improving. Now we've got the right hip and left hip at three weeks. So what do we do now, Scott? Well, it doesn't look so good because uh, both are still wide. Um, it's a lot depends on your exam whether these are, sometimes you can't tell in the ultrasound alone uh, whether the hips are sliding into position and you really need an ultrasound and wide abduction to see if they're seating. Um, or, or if you can feel them going in. If they're not, then you usually need to go to a more stable brace to try to salvage it. Because uh, sometimes the pavlik is just too loose for this type of hip, and you need more stability brace, and an abduction, a fixed abduction brace can be used at this point to see if you can stabilize these hips. How about it, Kishore? How long will you keep the harness on without success? Yeah, I, you know, I think my upper threshold is about three weeks. 
So at this point in time, three weeks in hardness, I'd probably abandon the hardness. All right. Well, um, this patient uh, actually questioned and disclosed the parents have been using tight swaddling with the hips adducted in the harness. So the harness really hadn't been used properly. Would that change your thinking, Kishore? Yeah, if, if, if they really haven't used the harness properly, I, I'd probably keep going for another week or two, but, uh, but putting the, you know, teaching them how to put the public on. And uh, I, I know there's no evidence for exactly at what, how many weeks, but my sort of practice has been three weeks. So I might go for another week or two if they've not been treating it well. I mean, yeah, maximum two more weeks. Okay. I well, think, Chad, uh, yeah. this is a good point because often we forget to ask the patients about swaddling when we start the pavlik, and unfortunately, usually a nurse picks up and gives gives your hand out uh, out. Uh, about swaddling and how to do a proper swaddling. So when you start the harness, you need to brief the family, ask them about swaddling, and then brief them about keeping the hips apart. Yeah. So it was abandoned, and they were switched to plastisode orthosis. Um, and now the child's four weeks old, was three weeks in the harness, one week in the orthosis, no real improvement. Um, now six weeks old was three weeks in the pelvic, three weeks in the plastisode orthosis, and I think you can see that the left hip is improved considerably um, with the ab fixed abduction brace. The right hip remains, uh, I'm sorry, that's supposed to be the, the right hip there. This is the, uh, this is the right hip that I'm showing you on the screen right now. So Woody, what do we do now? So, I, I think you have to start back a little bit of what we talked about with the uh, with you know assessing that information about swallowing. I think you got to make sure that the family is using the uh, brace appropriately, that it's fit appropriately, and just kind of go back to the beginning and make sure that you're. Um, yeah, they're they're doing everything right this time with the plastic orthosis. They got the message that the right, the left hip went in, but the right hip didn't. Uh, yeah, I think at this point, I just lost the video here. I'm not sure uh, what's going on. But um, uh, at three weeks in the harness and three weeks in the brace, I, I would have no problem going a few more weeks, but we're getting pretty close to my threshold for saying uh, that I, uh, I may need to uh, to abandon the brace. But I, I do follow the acetabular morphology, and as, as you look at this, I feel like uh, you know I, I'm not seeing negative consequences in, in this acetabulum, uh, and I'm and because of that I'm I'm somebody that will go a little bit longer than the classic three to four weeks for pelvic pelvic disease as long as I feel like the acetabulum is still morphologically looking pretty good. Uh, sometimes adjusting flexion a little bit, um, and may even try again. I like the Ilfeld brace because I, I feel like I can adjust the abduction a little bit more precisely. So I'd probably give it a couple more weeks in in my preference being the Ilfeld brace. Uh, but if it still didn't work and I was somewhere around eight weeks to nine weeks, I probably would would abandon. Uh, okay, okay. Now we're eight weeks. They kept the pelvic they kept the plastic orthosis on for even longer, and it went five weeks and we're still in the same situation the the left hip responded the right hip is not um, actually at this point was switched back to the pavic harness and went another um, four weeks in the pavic harness and here we are so was that too long and have we damaged the hip Woody would you comment on that yes I, I um uh I probably would. I, I probably would not have switched uh, at that point for the extra uh, time in the pavlik, uh, and probably at that eight-week point would have uh, would have bailed at that point. Um, you know, you look at this, and, and again, if you if you trust this single kind of cut of the of the uh, of the ultrasound, you know, the the right acetabulum on the coronal view doesn't look as as healthy as it did before. So, uh, to me, that's morphologically what that concept of pavicarnis disease is, and, and to me, you're getting some some negative changes. So, I, I would say we've uh, we probably not done the best thing for this hip, and uh, at this point, you may still be salvageable, but uh, but I, I would rather not see those changes in the acetabulum. What would then? How do you manage it? You got one hip in and one hip out. Uh, so I would I would probably proceed with a closed reduction, and we we would do that. Um, you know, some people would wait until six months uh, for anesthetic reasons, but uh, um, I would wait a little bit. But at four months, I have no problem uh, doing a formal closed reduction in arthrogram in the operating room. How do you manage one in one out, um, Bruce? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I'd be following along Woody, I think. Um, I I generally try to put the hips in as soon as I can with an EUA arthrogram. Uh, 
the role of traction prior to that is always a bit of a, a question, particularly in this situation where you've had both out and you've now got one in. Uh, but I would I would probably still put the patient in some preoperative traction, overhead gallows traction, just to loosen up any contractures that may have developed around the right hip. All right. So one in, one out, people would do a closed reduction? I, yeah, Scott? I, I would. Well, I, you know, if the baby. Okay, I'll, I'll comment. I mean, if you're winning at one hip, you can keep going with the pavlik on that hip and just loosen up the other side so that you're not doing much. But it keeps the, the harness stabilized. And I've got one right now where I'm going to have to do a close reduction, letting the baby get a little bigger, but the, I'm not giving up on the one I've already succeeded on. So you can just loosen up the hip. Uh, straps on the, the 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 one. Okay, well let's move on. Now we've got a 14 month old, um, too old for a pavic harness, and this one is a an IHDI barely a grade four. If you look at that, the grade four is above uh, this. This is actually the tonus grade. So it's accepted fact in the United States that traction does not improve the rate of reduction. But um, that's about the same with and without traction. But in Europe and in Asia, overhead traction is widely used, and the success rate is much higher. Um, this is guided flexion abduction, and it's the traction that I learned years and years ago from Wood Lovell, where we gradually stretch the kid out into this position. And I think what it does is um, if you think of the dislocated hip here, well, when you flex the hip, the center of rotation is here, and so the hip rotates down and stretches the inferior capsule, and it may, and the abduction traction pulls it up this way, so it may actually facilitate reduction in a way that, that longitudinal traction doesn't do. And the success rates are much higher with this guided overhead traction and abduction. Success rates are 74 to 92 percent even in patients uh, older than 18 months. So supposedly lower AVN and late growth disturbances, but I don't know about that. So um, before we go on, do you want to comment on that, Scott? Do you use traction I, I like all? traction on these higher ones too, like Bruce. Yes, um, I do. Uh, um, we've, we have a home traction program and we, we will use it. But mostly on the grade four? Yes. What, so the higher grades you'll use traction. Do other people use traction on the panel? I, I use traction. Uh -huh. I don't use traction, and I think it might come down to what works for you. It's, uh, I mean, it may be that in Asia and in some parts of Europe it's easy to use traction. For our patients, it's very, very hard to use traction. I don't yeah. think there's um, a great benefit in using traction, to be honest. Okay. Well, we, we find that it helps in the higher grades like that, but we don't use it in the lesser grades. So I'm going to move on from this because I want to get to my other things. Does, we're doing our close reduction now. Uh, tenotomy, we'll pull the panel. We'll just go down. Is anybody that does it, do you always do a tenotomy? No. Scott? No, not, not if you've stretched it out already with the, the harness. Uh -huh. So it may not be too tight. Is there anybody that always does a tenotomy? What what percentage do you do, do you do a tenotomy? What percentage do you think you do? Ninety percent. Myself? Uh, yeah. No, I. Yeah. Seventy-five uh, percent. I'd say ninety percent in my hands. Don't you think it decreases the rate of AVN? <laughs> Don't know. Don't know, Woody. I, I, I'm probably around 70, 80 percent, um, and it's just a feel thing if I feel like it's tight. Yeah. I think it would be very hard to determine that the tenotomy was the what was causing the effect on the rate of AVN. Um, yeah. I agree with Scott. If you haven't stretched out with a pavlic harness, you don't need to do it. But I don't often do closed reductions as pavlic harness tends to work, and if it doesn't work, then I'll go straight to an open reduction. Mm -hmm. Like uh, like Nick Clark does, he delays the open reduction though. So here's our arthrogram. He would not be delayed. That's time. What's that? Fourteen month old child you presented. Oh yeah, that's true. Good point. 
<laughs> Good point. So now we're get, everyone's going to do an arthrogram. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, what I are, hate to be. Yes. But the voice of the chat, I do arthrograms. What's that? I hate to be the voice of dissent, but I get to do an arthrogram, which changed my mind. Um, you do your closed reduction. If it's a stable closed reduction, I don't think you need to do a, an arthrogram. And if you can't get a good closed reduction, stable reduction, then you need to do an open reduction. Well, an arthrogram can give you prognostic information, too. So for those who do an arthrogram, um, the needle approach, lateral, anterior, medial, doesn't matter. The other thing. Medium. Medial. 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 Yeah, medial. medial. And medial, medial. Chad, the other thing, I usually schedule them for bilateral arthrograms, so I have a comparison to the the distance on the normal side or the near normal side. Mm -hmm. That's so I'll interesting. both hips, so I can do. That's interesting. Okay, medial approach is preferred, I think, by most of us. Um, so just to review, this is an arthrogram that dies in, and here's a schematic drawing. And what we're looking at, if there's some uh, fellows attached here, is this is the die clearly, and this is the medial wall. So we're looking at this part. And uh, the die fills the capsule and goes over the head. So this is the medial wall. And this part is the psoas. There's some dye got injected into the psoas tendon where it goes down. So you'd like to not do that, but occasionally it happens. Um, the limbus is the cartilaginous acetabulum, like the labrum. Here's a normal looking limbus with this thorn sign and a little capsular um, recess. And this is an inverted limbus, which is rounded. And you can see these, the femoral head might be sitting out here and pushing that down. So this is what we look at, and this would be an inverted limbus right here. This would be sort of a displaced hip and a nice, a nice limbus. Um, and these are classified many, 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 many different classifications of arthrography. Um, so here are some, and how do these look? Um, Kishore, do you want to comment on these different uh, reductions? Yeah, again, you know, like Pablo, I, I do them for the sake of, you know, teaching my trainees how to do orthograms. Very rarely I've changed my decision based on purely what the orthogram looks. And no matter what the limbus looks like, I would, if the hip felt stable, I, I would just go for it. So I'd probably ask maybe Scott or somebody to comment on this. All right. Scott, do you want to comment? Well, the uh, little, I mean, you got the inverted limbus, and it's a little dis, uh, displaced. It's not, it's not into the acetabulum uh, deeply, so that might be a problem. Some of these, if they're pretty stable, when you hold them, you could, you could redo the arthrogram in a month in the after the casting. Um, the next one is a little bit better. Uh, uh, it's, it's a little tighter. Uh, you can see it, it's in there, and and again, the comparison to the other side would be helpful. You're still a little distracted there, or displaced, but not bad. The bottom left corner, um, it doesn't look so good. You're not deep in the socket there either. You got again the inverted limbus. Here's here's the, the final head. one. Here's the femoral head, and right. there's the medial wall over there. It's got all kinds of junk between the femoral head and the medial wall. That's a mess. Right. And then the last one, pretty acceptable looking right there. Again, not deeply inside, but that's often the picture on the first arthrogram, and it should be better in a month. Uh -huh. So that's the medium, in a safe zone. That's the displacement. What do you think, Bruce? Yeah, no, yeah. I, li I like them. I like your comments. I think. Uh, what we're finding is uh, because we do arthrograms, and uh, I'm interested in Pablo's comment, but we're also getting an MRI in the immediate post-operative period when we think we've got a closed reduction or, or not, and it's giving us some in interesting information as to what is the stuff uh, in the medial wall area as well as what is inverted or not. Is there such a thing as a neolimbus and so on? And that's what I'd have perhaps called that area there is perhaps representing a neolimbus there. Mm -hmm. Which area? Up here? 
Now on the bottom left one, uh, this where the arrow is. I'm put, trying to put the arrow on. There's a blue line, and then yeah. it comes back in again. Not yeah. that one. That one. That one. Okay. Well. Um, Hattori has classified these as far as limbus shape, and uh, if they look good, secondary surgery is about 15%, and if they're thick like this, even if they're thick, it's about a 49% secondary. And he also did a study where he did a second look and uh, found that you know some look better the second time around, and they did better, obviously, than ones that didn't. So the we repeat ours, we repeat ours in six weeks, and um, this is a this is a video. The interesting thing was is the bean-shaped uh, uh, femoral head here, and yeah. how we sort of talk about con congruous reduction. It's a fallacy. It's an incongruous reduction. But you'd accept that one, right? You you Not accept so that sure. reduction. Would you accept that reduction? I'm not so sure. Um, it looks as though there's still maybe a lot of uh, material on that medial side, and um, it, it would concern me to accept that. Uh, so who, I who would, uh, what, what, what would what would determine it for me was if I how stable it was in that position. Did I have that, to put it in an extreme position? If it was a, a non-extreme position, I may accept it and do as uh, uh, Scott's talked about, an, an early second arthrogram at uh, a month. But again, as I say, we are getting some interesting information out of the MRI immediately post-op in this particular situation. And if that then confirmed real blocks to reduction, we would proceed to an open reduction. It feels quite stable. So you the, the the real the real the real problem is you know does having docking of the hip does that create a vascular necrosis? That's what Nick Clark's thesis is all about in the sense that the cartilaginous vessels are prone to pressure effects and therefore AVN if you use the femoral head as your battering ram to dock it as uh, John Roberts used to talk about in the day. I think most of us would accept that because the distance between the head and the, and the bone is pretty limited and it feels very, very stable, which kind of goes to Pablo's comment that, um, you know, if it feels stable, you'd accept it, right, Pablo? Right, exactly. Scott, do you accept that one? Yes, but I, no. again, I, as we talked about, probably redo it in a month. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here we are, different types of um, netting to put under them. We prefer to use the Gore-Tex, but we don't always get to. Here's the cast. It might be worth noting that these videos are available on the website as well. They will be. Um, any comment? Oh. Well, I think you got too much bulk there with the with the uh, Gore-Tex and the padding that you don't feel the hip. On. So I use that, but not on my first go. I really want a very thin layer of Webrel and my fingers on the hips to be sure that they're held in the good position. So I'd be worried with this much soft tissue bulk uh, in my first cast. I kind of agree. I I I prefer not to use the felt. Um, but this uh, rope method to hold the child against you actually was reported you know, 50 years ago or more by Fetweiss, where the rope goes over the abdomen and then around back and wraps around the person. It's a way to hold them against this. I, I haven't used it, but uh, Pablo uses it regularly. I mean, uh, Jose uses it regularly. And then you pull this out. It doesn't seem to cause any damage, and it does hold the child down against the post. Comments? Okay. Well, this is just a very Not technically easy. demanding cast to put on. Um, this is something you just you can't just um, tell a resident to put it on. This is something you, they need to see you do and watch you do a couple of times. 
Another good way to do it is have the anesthesiologist give you counter traction on the, at the shoulders. That keeps the baby down as well. Uh -huh. Do you do you put on the cast or do you hold the baby, Pablo? Um, well, because we're doing teaching a lot, we tend to do it one on one. So I would say half the time I, I I'm putting on the cast, but I think it's more important to hold it. Uh -huh. I think so too. I hold the I hold the baby, and uh, and then you got to mold the trochanter really well. How about this hip position? Um, looks like it could do a little more flexion, especially on the left hip. Uh, but abduction looks okay, and again, you need to hold it in the stable position. Yeah, it's pretty stable there. Anyone yeah. concerned about that position? Looks pretty good. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, you you might have it internally rotated. You would internally rotate or you would not? No, externally. The hips would be externally rotated. Yeah. You'd, I can't tell what the position is. It's Well, it's in about, I'd say it's in, uh, you know, about 60 degrees of abduction and 90 degrees of flexion and about 10 degrees of internal rotation. And that's okay. where it was most stable. So it's not wide abduction. Okay. Which is okay. important. Here, here's a CRM image in the cast in the OR. Recent paper said that the CRM was as good as all the other stuff, but here we do. Um, it's a CT scan example of Shenton's line on the CT or MRI. Um, here's Shenton's line. Do you all do CT MRI after every one? We, we do MRI. Scott? Hi. Uh, I'd say uh, I hold it, and I, if I'm happy and haven't felt anything, and I got a good floral with the dye still in it, I, I stop. But I bring them back in a month, so if there's any problems, I will have enough. How about it, Bruce? Yeah, no. Very we, as I said, we we're routinely using MRI now, just uh, as an ongoing investigation of what are the blocks to reduction. Yeah. So this this hip. Uh, this is another view of the MRI. It looks good. Hips in. Here's the labrum. Um, office one week after reduction. X-ray looks good. Here's a six-week. Um, what's that? Chad, well, your flexion looks less. I would have thought you'd be up a little higher and closer to 90 degrees. I think, sometimes, 90 degrees. I think sometimes after the cast is put on, the baby's leg kind of flops down a little bit. I think it's the way they take the X-ray. It was just the weight of the legs tend to tend to flex the torso a little bit, and that's my experience. Make it look like this. Um, but this is a second arthrogram at six weeks. Here's the labrum. It looks great. No doubt. Hi. Real painful. Yeah. Which test? doesn't do them, so there's no problem. Yeah. Do you do you repeat them, Bruce? Yeah. And um, yes. Do, do you check stability or do you just do the arthrogram? Um, usually just do the arthrogram. Yeah, that's my feeling. I don't. I mean, you put them in a cast to get them stable. I sure don't think. I don't think you want to put them through a range of motion at this point. You want to just do the arthrogram, see what it looks like, and put a new cast on. It's really a cast change without much manipulation. Same in the same in the uh, pavic harness. When you're doing the ultrasound of the pavic, you don't want to manipulate the hip until the very end, and then you might check stability, but not not a hip you're trying to become stable. So now we're 19 months old. It's been four months in the cast. I usually don't do an arthrogram at this point, but it was done, um, and this is a repeat arthrogram. Four months in the cast. So how long do you go in the cast, Kishore? Yeah, that's probably my my upper limit is probably three months, and then I change them to just a, a cruiser brace, um, and which you know they walk around probably for another six weeks or so, and then I just go to nighttime brace. And before I discontinue, I get two X-rays, one with hips in neutral and one in the brace. Every time they come, that's the routine. They get one X-ray in the brace and one out of the brace with legs in neutral position. So you're basically four and a half months full time brace, full time immobilization. Yeah, no, I'll 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 discontinue the brace, and I will get X-rays with legs in neutral if it's showing that you know the kid is able to keep the hips in uh, without going into the abduction position. I will I will discontinue the brace just for nighttime. All right. Um, 
how long, Scott? Uh, three to four months to cast, and then until I have a, a wonderful acetabulum uh, in the brace, I'll keep it going. Now, at 18 months, as a child's 19 months, you're getting close to having to go just at nights. Uh, so I'd probably keep going at nights. So, you, well, actually, um, four to six months full-time mobilization is recommended by most authors. If you look at the different textbooks, um, it's four and a half months and no splinting four months, uh, three months, then full-time bracing for two months, three months, then full-time one month, and then although Hattori said one month and then full-time bracing for three to six months. So when we talk about bracing after the cast comes off, it needs to be full-time, and I think four and a half to six months is probably standard full-time. Um, it's pretty much what everybody here is doing? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Well, this yeah. child, uh, this child was actually continued. We often continue to cast for six months if we can, particularly these older kids. And this was seven months after cast removal. And when we take the cast off, we try not to get one in neutral because we think the abductors are tight. Now, maybe if they've been in a brace for a while, they're not. But the abductors are contracted after being in the cast, so we don't want to lever the hips together uh, too quickly. We just take the X-ray as it lays. That's two years and four months. Now we're at age three years and four months. Um, anybody want to comment on this? No comments? Uh, it looks like you've got the avascular necrosis, the head's small, and you got some cox of alga. Uh, so I think you have a growth disturbance uh, yep. that may be causing some of your valgus. But the socket looks pretty good. Yeah, that's the problem. This one has AVN, and I think everything was done right. I mean, the you know the hip position. You guys said it was okay. Um, it happens. It was a high dislocation, though. It does seem like these grade four dislocations are more likely to get AVN. So um, I think that's the end of our cases. We did pavic harness and cast application. We could go on for a long time, but it's ten o'clock. Uh, any final comments about closed management? Scott, we'll go down the line. Any words of wisdom? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I keep going with bracing, like I was alluding to, till about 18 months uh, of age, full time, and then if they still have dysplasia, we'll go to nighttime use that uh, Woody has written about. I've been doing that for a long time. Kishore? Yeah, so uh, I. No, that's about the end on bracing. Yeah, for me, I'd I'd use nighttime bracing for a long time as long as it doesn't affect their ambulation, especially in ambulatory care. So, uh, I'd use in that kind of scenario probably for about six months of nighttime bracing. Pablo. So for me, I mean, take-home message: you need to start treatment early if you can get bracing started early. That's your best chance at it working well. And I brace until the hip looks normal or until the child doesn't tolerate it anymore. And for me, if the brace doesn't work, I'm more likely to go to an open reduction than try a closed reduction because it's the same as doing bracing. Very good. Bruce? Yeah, I think the only only final comment really that I often say to the in teaching situations is if in doubt, the hip is out. So if you have an index of doubt in your mind that this isn't going the pathway you want, you want to really be absolutely sure that you've got to achieve the first goal, and that's to get the reduction. Uh, so I've, I've had a number of patients referred, as well as my own, that I thought were okay, but in fact were splinted or treated or casted in an out position, and uh, those hips are the ones that really do prove to be most problematic in the longer term follow-ups of all the patients with and avascular necrosis and need for redo surgeries and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so if in doubt, it's out. And so you'll brace them a little longer. Woody? 
Yeah, so I guess my uh, take-home point would be uh, kind of close follow-up. I think everybody would agree that getting to these hips earlier will lead you to a better result, but I think it's really important to keep following these hips because uh, you're always going to find a few, if you treat enough of these, you'll find a few that just don't behave the way you thought they would at longer term, and, and if you're following these hips, uh, you'll be able to catch that. And I'm also a big believer in nighttime bracing uh, for as long as possible uh, until the kids just absolutely don't tolerate it and start throwing it out of the crib. So. Well, at, at risk of going a little bit over, I'm going to ask one more question. We didn't mention the ossification center. So you guys would do close reduction with or without an ossific nucleus? Let's go down quickly. So you do close reduction in an eight-month-old? Yes. Without, yes, I would. Yes. Yes, yes I would. Yes. yes, I would. If I was Re doing a close reduction, yes, but I'd probably wait and do a yeah. delayed opener. <laughs> okay. So you're, you're, in, uh, you're in Nick Clark's camp. Bruce? Yeah, no, we, we tend to do it as it's coming along, but we're evolving. Yeah. Woody? Yeah, I do uh, close reductions, but I'm a big believer. We haven't talked very much about this, but uh, perfusion MRIs. So I do uh, MRIs in all my close reductions, looking at flow on top of position. And so I feel like that's made me feel a little more comfortable doing close reductions. Uh, early. Interesting. Yeah. So none of us really wait on the ossification center. And I think the other, uh, the other message is that we're all pretty aggressive in starting early with questionable hips and bracing a long time. So I want to thank our panelists and I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to remind you that September 9th we're going to discuss surgical management. I hope you'll join us then. So that concludes our webinar. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.